Okay, by my timing, that's 12.15. Let's kick things off here. Welcome to the weekly charting analysis webinar with CMC Markets and myself, Jasper Lawler. Just kind of a quick breeze through the, the risk warnings here. Should mention, as always, that feel free to, to fire through questions at any point. I'm happy to address them, uh, whether it be some particular instrument you're interested in or some setup on the charts or a particular piece of news. Happy to give my uh, my opinion. So here she blows. Here is the CMC Markets platform. Um, you know we're uh, we're about to see a new record open in the the S&P 500. Um, these are all the the various sectors. Uh, this is something I, I posted last week. Uh, you can see that the uh, it's uh, the technology sector that's. Uh, gaining the most ground and pushing the market higher the most at the moment but if we um, just for your traditional candlestick analysis we can see that we've basically pushed above this tight recent trading range that we've been in uh, just about and into new record territory. I would argue that it's not a very confident looking breakout of that previous peak and it's definitely some scope for a uh, for a false breakout still um, you know if you're brave there's room for a counter trend trade here but we're we're over 70 on the uh, the RSI so looking a bit overbought but obviously the trend is higher so path of least resistance is for higher prices um, but only narrowly outside of this this trading range at the moment another thing to bear in mind is that the the US 30 our proxy for the Dow Jones Industrial Average is still beneath those peaks that we reached earlier in the, in, in July, <coughs> but I would say, given that the the S and P is set to open in new record territory, I would say that odds are favouring the 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 U S thirty at least going for a run up towards that eighteen seven hundred mark, which would be just a, a bit of round figure resistance um, as we trade up into record territory where it's obviously all just open air there's no previous support or resistance to really tell us and as I mentioned in last week's webinar a very optimistic scenario is that uh, this the Fibonacci extension of this move and correction would push us up to 19,700 but obviously uh, got 19,000 in the way first and that would be quite uh, quite an impressive move to get up there So summarising, I think the uh, the trend is higher, uh, but obviously it's um, you know it's it's difficult mentally to to buy into record highs. You know, there's we always have a temptation to believe the tops in, and obviously there will be some short term top at some point. But you know, it's it's almost impossible to picture exactly where. Uh, my my attitude towards it is uh, just from the experience I have of watching the markets is that um, you know it's really better to to try and ride the trend rather than try and predict its end. Uh, so what's driving these gains? Well, I think um, certainly the Bank of England's played its part. Of, um, you know, we can have a look at the, the UK 100 as well to see that. Um, the Bank of England obviously stepped in with more aggressive monetary policy than, than most expected. Um, and having done so, it pushes back the expectation that the Fed can be the only central bank out there diverging with the rest and hiking interest rates. So that's obviously positive for, for US stocks if the Fed hold back, but maybe the economic data in the US is 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 improving a little bit, you know, judged on the, the non farm payrolls result that we had on Friday. So that's a bit of the Goldilocks scenario that stocks like, you know, monetary policy uh, in the Fed uh, remaining easy in the US, um, getting easier in, in Europe. And uh, of course, uh, economic growth looking a bit better in Q3 than it was in Q2 for the US at least. Um, we had some economic data, today, not economic data, but some, some data from Visa suggesting that consumer spending was pretty stable, actually ro rose in July month over month. And so uh, they said that the growth in consumer spending had moderated a bit, but, uh, you know, still still growing. So obviously no real signs of Brexit fears there. 
not evidence um, matching that of what happened in, with with business sentiment, where manufacturing and service companies reported, uh, you know, uh, a big drop off in in new orders. So it remains to be seen who who's going to prove correct here: the the consumer who keeps demanding these goods and services, um, and of which companies should respond to and keep producing them or uh, you know are the businesses right to, to be uncertain after the um, after the Brexit vote and, and uh, all the uncertainty around the trade deals and things <coughs> may to be seen we do have some hard economic data for the UK this week but it's industrial production um, it's uh, industrial and manufacturing production and that has a bit of a lag so unfortunately that won't tell us too much about post Brexit Britain but it will be a bit of a bit of hard economic data to corroborate where the the UK economy was up in that lead up to the Brexit vote and um, so far the hard economic data um, you know not just surveys and sentiments and things um, has actually been fairly decent for the UK in uh, uh, you know the end of Q2 so here we are having broken out of this previous range in the uh, the UK 100 and we've <coughs> we stalled at this peak from August sort of 6th now we're up at this previous peak around sort of July 20th July 17th uh, we did pop above there but we're coming off the highs a bit today so <coughs> th this this I would argue is quite a quite a, a solid resistance and I actually had this line in and didn't really have this this previous peak which actually did work quite well um, just because I just because I noted the strength of the pullback uh, back in in May of 2015 when it was acting as support, and then it uh, and then it acted well again as resistance later. So I had that as a as a stronger level than this level. So we are up there now, and if we do get a pull back down past this previous peak, um, you know, if we pull out to the weekly chart, that would start to look a bit like a false breakout. Nonetheless, same principle. The trend is higher, but we're just uh, we've got a bit more resistance because obviously we're below uh, record peaks for the UK 100. So I um, think we need to <coughs> we really need to be clearing this 8875 up here before we can start feeling a lot more confident and thinking that we can actually go up and challenge that 7100 again and, and new record peaks for the for the UK 100 and <coughs> and the FTSE 100, obviously. I mean, my, you know, if you if you project this this range of about five eight hundred to about six five hundred, you know, you call that a seven hundred point range. You add seven hundred points on top of six five hundred, that puts you to seven two hundred. So a very a very simplistic sort of uh, mirror effect of that range projected above. Now that we've broken above it, um, uh, would be positive for the market. So, you know, if you are looking for some sort of, you know, emotional stability when you're buying into these uh, new peaks, uh, you know, that's that's something to bear in mind. There is uh, there is some technical reasoning here that this, this trend could continue. Um, let's have a look at uh, the Germany 30. So, th so this is interesting. Uh, so we had, you know, it's um, various levels of, of support and resistance working quite effectively here, um, in a complicated manner, I should add. So we had the downsloping trend line, which we broke above, but we failed at the previous yearly resistance. You know, the 2016 highs um, came back down broke back through that declining trend line but found support at the 200 day moving average and we've rallied straight back up to that um, 10500. My interpretation of this situation is that while 10500 certainly could be resistance again I think the fact that we're back up here so quickly after having touched it recently would to me suggest that the market's poised for a breakout higher and uh, the next major level of resistance in my mind <coughs> is about 10870 which uh, you know, in a way, looks much similar to um, the kind of support and resistance that we were looking at in the in the FTSE 100 different dates. Uh, but that same principle as to why I've actually pulled out that level, just because it's worked on a couple of occasions. 
and obviously just below just above there we have the the 11,000 round number mark so still inside the range for now but you know looking at the the higher lows on the on the, the RSI and momentum the fact that we're not actually overbought yet and that we've you know so quickly turned around off the 200 day moving average to me suggests some some demand and you know if you you know if you're looking for an excuse fundamentally i think again it's um you know if the bank of england have eased policy um while that's not necessarily great for exporters from europe into the uk because obviously sterling is weaker uh, euro proportionately higher it probably does increase the odds of the ecb expanding policy at some point in the not too distant future and so that would obviously be um, supportive of, of European markets and the Germany 30. Another sort of big mover today is uh, is the oil market so that the chatter today has been that uh, Venezuela and a few other oil producing countries are trying to organize a freeze in output amongst OPEC. Um, we've already had a good rebound off the lows, so this is just kind of adding to it a bit. And obviously, given that we've already come, you know, we've already seen sort of three pretty solid days of gains today, the momentum's slowing off a bit despite this news. Um, but I would also argue that it's, it's in part due to the fact that any sort of agreement at this stage to me seems unlikely because we still have a big spat between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, Saudi Arabia if you remember basically refusing to freeze its own output unless Iran's involved but Iran doesn't want to do anything until it's um, scaled up its production back to those kind of pre-sanctions levels and so um, <coughs> Iran actually has expanded production a lot faster than most people thought. The general expectation was it would take around a couple of years to get their oil output back to the same extent that it was uh, before the US and the, and the West in general put sanctions on them because of their, their nuclear program. Obviously since that those sanctions have been lifted, the nuclear program has been sort of uh, agreed upon to some extent. Um, they, uh, you know, they've really ramped it up and they, uh, Iran is not far off its pre sanction levels now. And so, to my mind, November, when the next OPEC meeting is, uh, w it is a bit of a live meeting, if you like. It's, it's potential that actually they do reach some agreement. Because, you know, if Iran has got its all output back to where it is, they have a bit more of an economic reasoning to go along with an output freeze to try and uh, stabilize prices um, because, they, you know, they've, they've got their output to where they want it again. Um, so, I, so, so the timing as far as now looks a bit dubious to me as far as any kind of agreement. Um, so on that basis, you know, this, this rally may run out of steam fairly soon because fundamentally it's not, uh, it's not all there for, to my mind. And uh, I would still characterize this as a downtrend, uh, but we have... So, Basically, if you take the median of the Brent and WTI prices, you know, Brent basically found support at 41, WTI found support around 39, the median's 40. You know, so you could sort of say uh, 40 plus a 200 day moving average is quite strong support. And so well, that's why I think we're getting a good technical rally here. Uh, but it certainly would not be a surprise to me to see uh, sometime before, and using our cash prices here, before 45 or 45.50 where we had this uh, the low from July um, it wouldn't be a surprise to me to see the market roll back over and try to retest somewhere near those lows but I think probably what we're looking at here in general is that this sort of 45 to 50 range has transitioned into a new lower range of, of maybe 40 to 45 Obviously, you've got to change that opinion. Should we break below um, 40, uh, that median level of 40, 41 on the Brent chart? Uh, but to my mind, that, that looks less likely at the moment, given the strength of this rebound. If we do take out 41, then obviously the round number 40, that corresponds quite well with a 50% retracement of this entire up move for this year. So if this 
you know, if, if we if we see, see some big selling coming into this this rally here, you know, maybe it can get halted down there at some quite strong confluence of resist uh, of, of support. But even if we get down to 40, obviously that still kind of supports a sort of 40 to, to 50 range in Brent. Switching over to, to gold now. So I mentioned in my, uh, uh, well, uh, we mentioned in the, uh, the evening note on, on Friday, uh, the evening call that the fact that gold put in a, a lower peak here, uh, not quite being able to take out the 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 highs from from July 11th, or well I think the actual high was here July 6th. To me, this down move here uh, suggests you know maybe you know gold's in a, a bit of trouble. I mean the reason that gold's fallen off obviously is that we got a big rebound in the dollar and. So the rebound in the dollar is because the economic data in the US was strong. Um, but as we were saying earlier, yes, the economic data in the US is strong, but can the Fed really go up against every other central bank in the world, which is, is cutting interest rates and be the one to, to diverge so strongly by, in fact, tightening policy and hiking rates? is is quite debatable. So if you're of the opinion that the Fed are going to hike rates, obviously that's negative for gold. That supports the idea of a, something along the lines of a double top forming here, um, or uh, you know, if you believe the Fed doesn't really have much scope for tightening, and they've got the good excuse of the U.S. election coming up as well, um, then then actually you you know you th this is just a correction in gold, and um, you know you'd be looking at that one three hundred level to to hold. By the way, I, I've got this line in here, and I think it is significant. You know, we had a series of um, uh, sort of opens and closes in around this sort of one three thirty type area, and that's why that's right where we are now today. So um, a close above that level today um, could see Kitty Gold supported in the interim below there, and I think a, a test of one three hundred is is certainly on the cards. Of course, not certainly, but uh, likely. And if you uh, and if you do use momentum indicators, just sort of thinking it through here that um, we've had a, a couple of failed attempts to get through the 50 level uh, down below 50 on the RSI uh, would denote a sort of more bearish momentum, and then obviously that is coinciding with this this apparent level of of, of resistance turn support where we currently sit. Now I'll jump over to uh, the FX markets. As far as economic data, we, we had some data out of China today. Um, the trade data, you know, it was fairly weak, but it wasn't um, anything to really write home about. And I don't think it's worried markets too much. You can see mining shares are, uh, are stronger on the FTSE 100, um, a good indicator of um, the market's not being too phased, um, but it really is the data out of China that's um, going to dominate proceedings this week. Um, industrial production, uh, retail sales, uh, inflation data all coming out from, from China this week. Uh, and we've got the, the RBNZ, so the Reserve Bank of New Zealand rate, rate statement. Um, not typically something I put a lot of focus on, but I think it will just be interesting because obviously the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, they cut interest rates. So given the, the closeness of those two economies, you know, there's a bit of an increased speculation that the RBNZ might might do the same. So I'll just pull up the uh, the euro chart here. As I've been mentioning for several weeks in a row here, just very, very choppy in the euro. Um, we basically had a false breakout through through uh, through 112. So that was our resistance. We got a, a, and we got a, an immediate close the next day, 
and uh, that was a bearish engulfing candlestick so to my mind you know with the benefit of hindsight that that's not a bad setup when you have a, a decent resistance like this zone here that I've highlighted <laughs> a breakout here and then a sell right beneath it the following day with a bearish engulfing candlestick you know with the benefit of hindsight and it will sell down to the 200 day moving average and we found some support there um, obviously it took some strength for the market to be able to push out above that 112 and so I think the scope now for a fairly well defined down sloping uh, RSI trend line here that could turn into support near the 50 level and that would obviously um, be matching up with the 200 day moving average as a support so maybe with a bit of confirmation this could be the beginnings of, a, of another attempt at that 112 and then a push up towards 113. What can cause that? Well obviously for the euro to be rising the dollar has to be weakening and uh, that's not the current state of affairs. Um, the one bit of uh, US data worth noting is, uh, is US retail sales uh, but that's not until Friday. Um, the expectation there is for a bit of a slowdown uh, growth to moderate from 0.6% month over month to 0.4%. Uh, we do have on the same day we've got German GDP data as well um, and, and the first reading for European GDP so two big data points but uh, we we'll have to wait till Friday for those. Now let's have a look at sterling See the, I hope you're able to catch uh, my colleague Michael's video update um, on sterling post the uh, the BOE decision. So so far this uh, so uh, for those who attended last week, you remember that I mentioned that um, we had some scope for a a uh, inverse head and shoulders so this trend line is holding together quite remarkably um, so we came down to those new lows uh, new uh, sort of three week lows in uh, in cable but we bounced off this this same trend line. I'm trying to just get it clear to look at but uh, you can see it's it, it, it's holding up quite well this uh, the basically an extended right shoulder in this inverse head and shoulders pattern so um, you know that the fundamentally with uh, certainly a bit more of a sledgehammer than uh, the many were expecting they kind of doubled down on the, the cheap financing for bank banks to make loans and more QE than the most expected oh, I certainly didn't expect any QE and so uh, the fact that it was even at 60 uh, 60 billion a month in uh, new asset purchases including corporate bonds uh, is yeah certainly above and beyond the call and so that's that fundamentally is is pretty negative for sterling so it certainly wouldn't be a surprise to see it come and test down those brexit lows around 128 but like i said as at the moment uh, this is a possible formation where this would be the kind of simple breakout from here but this is becoming an extended right shoulder so feasible certainly still that we get a rally up to up to um, to 134 would probably be about where you see the neckline at the moment uh, oh got a uh, question on copper yeah I'll jump across to that um, question being on high grade I mean we just have the one copper contract really well, obviously we've got futures interpretations of it but in terms of the cash um, cash variant this is the really the only one that I follow and uh, you can see that we've we basically had a series of false breaks through the sort of 205 type level failed to get beneath 200 and we're right up towards the the top of the range uh, we got up to the, towards the top of the range before faltering right into the middle and so you know, I'm looking at this as a very trendless market at the moment and this is one of the kind of least you know, high, uh, you know lower probability trades is to buy or sell in the middle of a, of a trading range and I, I know it's choppy 
but to my mind this is a sort of 205 to 220 trading range and uh, so given the fact that we're right in the middle at 215 I mean it could go up could go down from here it's um, you know there is no real obvious trend to my mind you know that said we're above the 200 day moving average but you know it hasn't helped on these previous occasions has it so um, you know these the moving averages they only help when a they're trending in the right direction this this we were above the 200 day moving average but the 200 day moving average is actually sloping downwards so if we are in a bottoming process uh, it's still taking place it hasn't happened yet so uh, you know, that said, some pretty pretty good support down from this previous low because we obviously had these string of highs. Uh, we had that big drop down, uh, but failed to uh, failed to, to close below there, and so this the sort of two two ten to eleven has been uh, really strong resistance broken and then really strong support twice. So and it's you know it's only going to be a shade away from the two hundred moving average. So should should the price drop further to there, that would to me seem a a uh, an obvious inflection point. Uh, but like I said, that would be trading a support, but um, not in an uptrend. Just still within a longer term uh, range, which which does pose some risks. Theoretically, a busy week for the the outlook for copper this week because we have the Chinese data. Um, you know, I think copper at the moment is not as closely synced with Chinese data as you might have thought, and I think that's just because the Chinese data continues to underwhelm. But there's a sort of a bit of a confidence that things can improve uh, because the government is doubling down and uh, and just doing a lot of extra kind of government spending doing some deficit spending even uh, so that hope that that kind of infrastructure feeding spending is going to feed through particularly into the likes of the housing sector and, and maybe be beneficial for, for commodities so as long as we get sort of more hawkish talk from the Chinese government I think that's generally positive um, should they start to reel back from that you know that would maybe be the reason to um, to be worried on the downside. Equally, it's there, we've had sort of very spurious kind of news um, about copper um, being used as um, you know as a sort of a guarantee for loans in China, and so they were warehousing lots of copper, using it as collateral for loans. Uh, but then it turned out there wasn't actually as much copper as they said in the warehouses. Um, so you know that was a bit of a kind of confidence shocker and suddenly they weren't using copper as much for collateral so um, copper is not as useful as maybe it was in a financial sense when it was getting a good rally earlier in the year um, so that again is maybe a bit of a weight around its neck I'll slide back to currencies if it's alright. So we looked at sterling. Let's have a quick look at uh, euro against the pound. So, you know, we've uh, we've we've held this this rising trend line pretty well. A big bullish engulfing candlestick off the rising trend line, taking us above this previous resistance, uh, taking us above the previous peak. So, you know, I think generally looking quite. Um, you know, quite supportive at the moment in euro sterling um, and again sort of, you know the ECB uh, kind of on hold at the moment even though eventually down the road they might be forced to do more um, whereas obviously the Bank of England are in sort of easing mode so fundamentally reason for euro sterling to push higher and uh, I would say that's still still generally the short-term trend at the moment um, it, it, you know it's a weak looking trend uh, and then you know, I think obviously the the guidepost for me as to whether you remain supportive of this this market remains supported or not would just be this rising trend line below there. And I think you know all bets are off. Um, then we get a drop down towards eighty again. But at the moment, it looks like it's looking for a challenge back of um, the highs around eighty six. Last but not least, dollar yen. So one of the, certainly one of the better trends out there. This is the the weekly chart. 
Um, so, in, you know, really a nice strong downtrend to be part of, um, but we've hit that 100 level. So the question mark is, does, does 100 call the bottom in dollar yen? I think there is some scope for that. Uh, we took out this, you know, I had a rising trend line off the, off the lows here, but it was only two touches, so not too much to be read from that. You know, you want three touches at least on a trend line for it to be valid. Um, but, you know, people are buying in at 101, you know, obviously uh, taking us above 102. Signs that there is, you know, a bit, of, you know, some long term buying at this big psychological 100 mark. So at the moment we're range bound and, you know, we're, we're kind of back drifting. You know, this is a lower probability trades as we get up towards 103, but then he dips down towards 101, 100 again. You know, you're you're in a downtrend and you're buying the bottom of a downtrend, but it's it looks like it's transitioning to a range. Uh, that said, should we get a push to 104? I think by the time we get there, we'll be back in the vicinity of the 50-day moving average, and uh, that was good support from July 13th and uh, July 26th. So scope for a, a fall away from that 104 mark should we get there. Um, but maybe, maybe won't be enough to be a sustained drop down to the lows. So that pretty much calls the 30 minute mark for today's webinar. Thank you all very much for attending, much appreciated. Um, good luck with the trading this week and see you at the same time next week. Jasper signing out.